For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure, for those of you who have not yet had, had the pleasure of hearing John Grisham, and I know that each and every one of you has had the pleasure of reading his books, you may not have heard his very inspiring remarks at lunch today, nor would you have heard his rejection of my job offer. I, I don't think he was willing to take the cut and pay. Uh, but John is uh, very passionate about uh, many things uh, involving justice, and, and he will talk to us about a few of them. Um, we will get to that in a moment. But first, uh, I'd like to introduce Alan Kadish, the president of Turo College and University System, who will have some remarks, and then Bruce, and then I'll formally introduce John, and we'll give him the award. So, uh, Alan Kadish. Thank you very much, Dean Ballin. First, uh, I'd like to thank Bruce Gould and his family who've supported uh, this book award for quite a while now. It's a pleasure to see Bruce and a, a pleasure to be here at the book award. And we've had a remarkable series of honorees in recent years, as you know, Justice Sotomayor, Brett Stevens, and uh, we're very excited to hear uh, John Grisham today. Uh, like most Americans, I grew up with a lot of lawyer jokes, the things about the shark and the lawyer and all th sorts of things like that, which I'm not gonna tell today. And besides, my timing's really bad. But um, I also spent a, a good deal of time as an expert witness. And I thought a little bit about um, some of the issues that lawyers face in practice and reputationally as well. And I think what one can see in John Grisham's books, many of which I've read, is the perils and the temptation of an adversarial system to bend the truth, to move things too far, to introduce corruption into a system which is basically about justice and morality. And what I've loved about reading John's books is that he has a way of novelizing, of course, those dilemmas and making them really hit home. And it's extraordinarily important for people who are involved in the law, which is essentially all of us, because we deal with legal issues every day, to understand how lawyers have to face these dilemmas and through his protagonists and heroes, figure out the right way to deal with them. Um, this book that we're honoring him for today, The Rooster Bar, of course, is not so much about law as it is about education, which kind of really hits home. So oh, I know John is gonna talk both about the Innocence Project and about his book, but we're very excited to have him here. Uh, I've enjoyed reading him, and I'm looking forward to hearing him speak. And here's Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kadish, Dean Bowen, Provost Salkin is here somewhere. There she is. In the back. Faculty and students. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And, and most importantly, our, our honored guest, John Grisham. John, when we, Dean Glickstein, who's sitting right there, former Dean Emeritus Glickstein, and I came up with this honor about 30 years ago, and I can't believe it's 30 years, we wanted to uh, pay tribute to an outstanding publication related to the law, the legal profession, or the international rule of law. But more significantly, was our second goal, to impact the students and at the law school and bring an outstanding author to inspire, teach them about the law, teach them the importance of the law and how it, it, it works in everyday life. And um, while you were speaking at lunch or whatever, I, I, I found it fascinating that, you know, how the law has changed, but the law remains the same over the years. And, and uh, it, it's amazing, and, and your, your knowledge and, and how you can put pen to word um, is, is truly extraordinary. I think you epitomize um, this award, and, and after this, I think it'll be the 24th presentation of this award. We couldn't have asked for anybody more timely, more uh, amazing, and your effect on the, the, the law, the lead community, and just everyday life is truly amazing. I want to thank you for being here. Um, you truly exemplify the spirit of, of this award. To students here, um, what I find amazing, and, and uh, I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, John started out 
practicing law, but he found his real calling as an author and writing both fiction and nonfiction um, to amazement. Uh, over 300 million copies, I believe, are in uh, existence or in somebody's home uh, over the years. So um, I don't think there's anybody more prolific. And uh, your work is amazing in the writing field, but your work in the philanthropic and charitable endeavors that you do are even more amazing. And speaking from a personal point of view, I went to law school, but I didn't. I chose a different calling. I went into a family business, and we, we were legal publishers for many years. But I also chose to, to do a lot of charitable and philanthropic work. And, and, and my message to, to law students and to people in the room, even if you go to law school and you don't practice, that law degree is, is going to be something that you're going to cherish your whole life. And, and it's going to be important no matter what endeavor you choose to go into in the future, that law degree will, will, will help you out. And, and I want to encourage you to, to go into your passions. Do what you really believe uh, is important to you, whether it's a practice of law or whether it's writing or whether it's legal publishing. Do it. And then when you do become successful, remember to be charitable and give back to especially this institution because it's been very special to me and it should be very special to you. I wanted to thank everybody who came here today, and uh, I really do appreciate it. My friends who came near and far, some from a couple hours away, some from Florida, and I really do appreciate it. To my cousins, Burke, Robin, and uh, Hani, you guys are the best, I love you. Thank you for being here. To my brothers, Jeffrey and Robert, um, we have many different things and different endeavors that we have passions about, but we share them together, and I really appreciate that you guys are always here for me. Finally, um, most of you know that my dad passed away three weeks to go today, and um, he loved reading. He was a voracious reader, and um, one of his favorite authors was John Grisham. When I told him that he was going to be our recipient this year, he was so thrilled to be here. Um, and uh, he didn't quite make it, but I know he's here in spirit. But I said to my mother, I said, Mom, Dad would always go. No matter what it was, if he got invited to something, he was going to go. And I told you that you can't miss this. And uh, I really appreciate you coming today. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I look forward to Mr. Grisham's remarks. Oh, I neglected one thing. If I could call both of you up, we want to present you with the give 2000. Me, give me the award, okay? Right, the 2018 Bruce K. Gould Book Award for your book, The Rooster Bar. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. All right, let's close. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, at Toro Law School. I'm delighted to be um, in this neck of the woods in New York. Uh, we, we coordinated this trip because tomorrow uh, I'm in uh, New York City, Manhattan, to publish my next book, uh, which happens every year now on the next to last Tuesday in October. And we do that to capture the Christmas market uh, because 30% th uh, of all books are sold at Christmas time. I didn't know that, so they make me publish in October. Uh, many thanks to uh, the Gould family for this award and for Mrs. Gould for being here. Um, and your generosity has made this possible and the um, list of past recipients is uh, very impressive. Uh, it makes me um, proud to receive you here today. Occasionally, when you write popular fiction, you don't win a lot of awards. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, they give those to the literary types, but occasionally we get a, a, a nice award that we deserve. But sometimes I'll get a letter telling me I've, I'm under consideration for a certain award that I've never heard of. And you look at the past recipients, and I've never heard of them either. So it's, e <laughs> it's easy to say no. Uh, but this award is very prestigious, and, and as is the, the past list, and I'm delighted to be here to get it. Thanks to the Dean, Dr. Kadish. Thank you guys for having me. I'm, Enjoyed my uh, visit here so far. 
Um, I was asked to talk about um, maybe Innocent's work and also maybe the Rooster Bar and maybe anything else that I wanted to talk about. Obviously, nothing is prepared. Um, so I'll ramble for a few minutes until somebody tells me to shut up. And then I'll take some questions from the floor if you want to ask some questions. It's very conversational. And you can't knock me off course because I'm not sure uh, where I'm going. When I was in law school, like some of you law students here, um, I was not dreaming of being a writer. Uh, I had never dreamed of it. I didn't study writing. It was not a childhood dream. Uh, I always read a lot. My mother had a healthy dislike and distrust of television, and so we couldn't watch much of it. We read books, a big family, lots of kids, and we spent a lot of time at the library. I just grew up with books everywhere. Uh, I stopped that pleasurable reading when I started law school uh, because you simply can't, you can't read for fun when you're in law school. Uh, for those of you who've read The Firm, it may call, come as a shock to learn that I was not heavily recruited out of law school. In fact, nobody offered me a job. In fact, I wasn't looking for a job. I wanted to go back to my small hometown in Mississippi and start my own practice. I knew some lawyers there. I didn't really care for them. Um, I thought I could do it better. And I also knew I was going to run for the state legislature in two years. I had my eye on this seat, my home seat, for a while. So my goal was to go back home Start a law practice. I married my childhood sweetheart. She's from the same town. We got married, and I went home and hung out my shingle and declared myself ready to sue. And I uh, almost starved to death. Uh, she was working as a teller in the bank to support us for a while as I uh, tried to build a law practice. Uh, back in those days, we did not have a public defender system in our county that wasn't big enough, and the judges would hand out the indigent cases, criminal cases. Um, sort of an old, it was a system that was not written. The older lawyers had done it, so we were expected to do it, the younger guys. And I signed up for every case I could possibly handle. I needed to work. It didn't pay much, but I wanted to be in the courtroom. And I handled a lot of criminal cases, and, and I handled whatever would walk in the door, really. I got elected in 1983 at the age of 28 to the State House. Uh, which should be against the law in every state, to be that young and making important decisions. And I was in a courtroom one day. I, I wanted to be a big-time courtroom lawyer, and I was hanging around a courtroom when I saw something that was extremely um, uh, dramatic. Uh, there had been this terrible um, rape of a little girl in our community by a guy who had just been paroled from prison, a really... Uh, nasty character and he broke in and he um, did all kinds of horrible things and it was an ordeal and he, when he left he thought she was dead and he certainly intended for her to be dead but she didn't die she lived and so a few months later they called him immediately and we had this trial her father was a guy I knew I didn't know him well um, nice enough guy, but not the kind of guy you'd want to start trouble with. And he had a big family. And they were nice, but pretty tough folks. And for a while, around our county, there was the, the gossip was wild with what this family might do to get revenge, retribution. And things were pretty tense for a while. A lot of us were sort of hoping they would take care of the situation. But they didn't, to their credit, and so it was time for a trial. The defendant demanded a trial. His court-appointed lawyer, I didn't ask for that case, was a buddy of mine from law school who got stuck with it. And I was lucky I never got stuck with the rape case or capital murder. And when they had the trial, uh, because I was an officer of the court, I could hang around the courtroom the judge, who was a great judge, he was my mentor, just a wonderful person, um, very wise. He knew how, he knew what was coming. And he did something I've never seen before or since. He cleared the courtroom, kicked everybody out. There was a big crowd. He put deputies at the doors and said, everybody out. Nobody can hear this, except the jurors, obviously the clerks, a few lawyers like me, 
and the litigants. And it was a very uh, tense situation, security everywhere, when they brought the little girl in. And she began to testify. She was 12 years old. And at times she was um, very brave. At times she was very fragile. She talked about things that were unspeakable. At times there were there was not a dry eye in the courthouse. I mean the courtroom. Uh, I was across the courtroom looking at the jury. 14 people, 12 and two jurors. I knew two ladies on the jury and they were all trying to hide their eyes, you know. We were all emotionally cooked. Uh, she, for two hours, she took us through every emotion known to the human soul. Hatred, revenge, love, pity. I, it was astonishing. I looked up one time and the judge was trying to hide his face. It was, it was um, the, only, uh, the only dry eyes belonged to the defendant who never showed any remorse. And finally, when she could not continue, she broke down and the judge said, we've had enough. Let's have a recess. And everybody who was in the courtroom could not wait to get out. And I hit a side door, went down the stairs, out the back of the courthouse, and almost ran to my car to get away from it. I got to my car and realized I left my briefcase in the courtroom in my hurry. So I went back in, up to the side door, the back stairs, and walked in the courtroom. And the defendant was sitting there all by himself with a deputy a few feet away, nobody else in this large courtroom. And I walked right by him to get my briefcase. And I had this thought that was overwhelming. Had that been my daughter, and I could get this close, give me a gun and let me get my justice, my retribution, and then look at that same jury and say, what are you going to do with me? And I left and drove back to the office. And that was the seed that became a time to kill, a father's uh, retribution. I had never written before uh, fiction. Uh, a judge or two referred to some of my pleadings and motions as fiction, occasionally. <laughs> uh, but I could write. I wasn't afraid to write. And I sat down, that big, I became obsessed with this story. And I finally said, okay, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try it. And one night, we had a, my wife had a small, our first child, a little boy, she put him to bed, she went to bed, because I was up late. I took a yellow legal pad, and I put chapter one, here's the first sentence. And you know, I started writing. And it took, um, it took three years to write my first book. When it was published, in 1989 by a very small, unknown publishing company in New York. Uh, they printed 5,000 hardback copies, and I bought 1,000 of them. <laughs> uh, the, the publisher had no money for publicity, and I was trying to make something happen, so I bought 1,000 uh, copies, and my, my thinking was, well, uh, we, did, we didn't have a decent bookstore in town. We had a nice library. So well, I'll go to the library, we'll have a huge book party. Your local boy publishes his first novel. I, you know, I can see the, and I'll invite all my friends to come and I'll have a thousand books there and I'll sell a thousand books. And I'll make some money retail, make some money on the royalties, I'll you know, hit them on both ends. That was my thinking. We have photographs of my kids climbing on a thousand copies of A Time to Kill. And uh, it was fun, we boxed them all up, but, you know, and we had a huge party. And when the book party was over, I still owned 882 copies of A Time to Kill. <laughs> and, I, and I had an invoice coming to pay for them, and I thought, oh, this is not working out. So I, I did something that was very smart out of desperation. I went to 35 libraries around the state, 
with a trunk load of a time to kill and so you know the, the friends would make punch and cookies and I would sell a few books and and we'd have book parties and I finally unloaded um, all those books and if you can find one now they sell for about four thousand dollars so do the math okay four thousand times one thousand so anyway that's how I got started uh, I told my wife, who reads everything, all my stuff, and, and a lot of other stuff, I said, I'm going I'm to try this one more time, one more book, and if that doesn't work, I'm, I'm going to forget this hobby and wrote out something else. And the second book was The Firm, and it changed everything overnight. Uh, I, I began writing all full-time, so I had plenty of stories and plenty to, to say, and I'd read probably, I don't know, 15 legal thrillers, when I was reading the New York Times one morning in December of 2004, 14 years ago, I love the New York Times, especially the obituary section, because the Times writes great obituaries about people you've never, never heard of. Some you have, some you haven't. The lead obituary on that morning was a picture of a guy my age, my race, my neck of the woods, just like me, and he was standing in a courtroom, and the headline said, Ron Williamson, freed from death row, dies at 53 and he was sitting there with a you know shirt and tie on and a jacket none of it fit and he had this kind of confused look about his face and I thought how does a guy like that wrongfully accused end up on death row and, the, and so I read the obituary and the first sentence reads something like this Ron, Ronald Keith Williamson who left his small town in Oklahoma to seek major league baseball glory but was later convicted and came within five days of being executed for a murder he did not commit, died last Saturday in Tulsa. The cause was cirrhosis of the liver. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to hook you people on the first page. I mean, I know a good hook when I see one, okay? And I, I read the entire obituary. He was the first round draft pick of the Oakland A's in 1972 in his little neck of the woods close to, um, what was Mickey Mantle's hometown? Comet. Comet, who said that? Comet, uh, Comet Oklahoma, yeah. Uh, he lived near Comet, and the scouts and coaches in that area were convinced that Ron Williamson was the next Mickey Mantle. And Ron certainly believed so. Uh, but he went off in, to the minor leagues and got in trouble, got hurt, and didn't make it. I read the entire obituary and I thought, this is too good to pass up. So I called my publisher uh, at Doubleday and I said, have you, have you read the Times this morning? He said, not yet. I said, read the obituaries and call me back. And he said, he called me back and he said, this, this has got your name written all over it. I said, this is my next book. He said, wait a minute, you have a two book contract for two more legal thrillers. I said, I don't care what my contract says, this is my next story. And so I jumped into the story, called the family, and took off to Oklahoma. And I jumped into this world of wrongful convictions. I had never thought about it before. I'd never been exposed to it before. I'd missed these big, high-profile DNA exonerations. I just, for some reason, I'd missed this part of the law that I take great pride in following, uh, all aspects of the law. But I, I, I could not believe I had missed a story like this. I, I could not believe that we have so many innocent people in prison. It's not just a few hundred, it's tens of thousands. I could not believe what happened to Ron Williamson. He was convicted with no real physical evidence. Uh, he was convicted by using a jailhouse snitch or two. He was convicted by junk science. A um, expert witness from the Oklahoma Crime Lab testified that the 17 scalp and pubic hairs found at the crime scene matched Ron Williamson's. Ha hair analysis is famously unreliable now, as is bite mark analysis and footprint analysis, even fingerprint analysis. There's so much junk in science in courtrooms these days. We're trying to get these people out of jail. Anyway, Ron, Ron's, uh, for Ron's defense lawyer, Barney Ward, was not, not legally blind. He was really blind, totally blind since the age of 16. He was his defense lawyer. And the week before the trial, the guy in the second chair quit the case, and the judge would not appoint somebody else. Uh, during the trial, Barney, if he, wanted to, 
if they were, if they were admitting documents and evidence or photographs, Barney would stand up and say, let me see that. And they had a system where they would call timeout, and Barney would walk out of the courtroom with a secretary, and she would describe it, whatever it was, the photographs or the diagrams or the documents or the lab analysis, whatever. That's how they got through the trial. And that was Ron's defense. Ron was already showing uh, signs of um, severe uh, bipolar, he was up and down, and they had him on a lot of meds, and they would withhold his meds in the mornings when he would go to trial. So in the courtroom, he was, he was crazy looking. Uh, he, he yelled at some witnesses. He, a couple times he said, you're lying, you're lying. Well, they were lying, okay. He knew they were lying. He didn't kill anybody. But it was all a frame-up job to get him. The, the cops and prosecutors had been convinced that he was their man. And he came within, um, he was quickly convicted. There were no mitigating circumstances in, in the sentencing. And Ron got the death penalty. And he went away to death row in Oklahoma. And about five years after uh, death row, he lost 100 pounds, uh, completely unmedicated, all his hair turned white, and he pulled his own teeth out. And he, he, was, he was, the poor guy was so sick and not being treated. In 19, that was 1987, 1992, they came and fetched Ron, took him to the warden's office, and they said, the warden said, full room with all the assistance there, you know, for dramatic effect. Uh, they said, Mr. Williamson, you will, you, you, your, your schedule execution is a week from today. Uh, we need to go through these items. Uh, you know, do, do you have any last words or what happens to your effects or who gets your body? What are you going to do with your body? And Ron said, I don't, you know, I don't care. Just give it to my sister. He didn't have a wife. Get, get, send my body to my sister. And they said, okay. At about that same time, a federal judge in Seminole, Oklahoma, had a law clerk who was the hero or the heroine of the story. She read Ron's petitions late one night, and she became convinced that he had not received a fair trial. She was not convinced of his innocence, but she was convinced that he had not received a fair trial. And Judge C, the federal judge, had no patience for habeas petitions. He just was famous for just, you know, denying everything. So the law clerk got all the other law clerks together, made them read everything. They all agreed that Ron had not received a fair trial. And they had an intervention. <laughs> they rushed into the judge's office. They lined up and they said, Judge, you're going to listen to us. This man did not get a fair trial. Stop the execution. And with five days to go, Judge C stopped the execution. When I interviewed Judge C for the book, I said, well, surely when it bounced up, you know, to the Tenth Circuit in Denver, somebody would have stopped it. He said, no, 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 not, not, not in our system back then, not in 1992. If I had not stopped it, Ron would have been executed. And so the execution was stopped. Ron was moved off of death row and found a doctor who began to help him with some meds, and he kind of slowly put him back together. Uh, Ron's co-defendant first heard of the Innocence Project in 1995 on a TV show, the old Donahue TV show. There was an inmate who had been exonerated by DNA. DNA was brand new. Barry and, um, Barry and Peter started the Innocence Project 25 years ago, I think, 1992. So DNA was just coming about. And his co-defendant contacted the Innocence Project on behalf of both of them. They took the case and slowly put it all together arranged for DNA testing. DNA testing revealed that the uh, real killer, a man that the police knew very well, uh, and the last person seen alive with the victim uh, had in fact raped and killed Deborah Sue Carter. Ron and Dennis were exonerated uh, on April 15, 1999, after 12 years in prison, and they sued half the state of Oklahoma um, and had good lawyers, and they won a bunch of money. And Ron, sadly, uh, it took him about five years to drink himself to death. That was the story of The Innocent Man. And it will be a Netflix documentary starting next month, six uh, one-hour episodes that is fantastic. And uh, I had nothing to do with it, um, I had a little bit to do with it. But it's really something that Netflix is proud of. So you'll see the true story uh, coming soon.
At this point, I could ramble for hours. Anybody got a question? Okay. Yes, sir. The uh, question is, Jake Brigantz is our star of um, Time to Kill, criminal lawyer, also a small town, kind of a ham and egg guy who will do anything. In, in Sycamore Row, his return, uh, he transitions to the civil side in a big wheel contest. The reason I did that, I would like to write a lot of stories about Jake, but you, you, know, you can only have so many sensational murder case, <laughs> trials in any one career, especially in a small town in Mississippi. So I was thinking, you can't have these sensational murders all the time in one place. You know, it's, it, the town's not like that. And I've got a, I got a really good idea for another one, one day. So I thought I would move Jake to the civil side to stay away from all the blood and gore. Um, I've got a great case, a great book I want to write from Ford County, but I'm waiting for two more people to die. <laughs> <laughs> and they're getting close. And when, I have a problem with lawsuits, okay? Um, the innocent man, I got sued um, four times, four, uh, four different lawsuits, three or four, by the bad guys. I mean, I knew, I, I had a good idea, I had a hunch it was going to happen. Uh, that's, and that's why I was so careful when I, what, I, what I wrote about these guys, the, the ones who caused the wrongful conviction. Uh, the book goes after them. The book shows their photographs. The book is an expose. The book is all accurate. You know, it's a true story. And they somehow felt offended and filed a, a, found a lawyer who would file a lawsuit. They didn't make it halfway to first base. We got it dismissed without even filing an answer, but it took two years and you know, a lot of money and legal fees. So I try, I'm not afraid of lawsuits, but I'd, I'd rather avoid them. Uh, they're just, they, they eat up so much emotional energy. Question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the question is the king of torts and what, uh, what inspired me to write about mass torts and class action lawsuits and uh, I'm, not sure, well, I'm not sure what the inspiration, if, if there was an inspiration for that story. But I am, um, by the way, I ripped off the title from, um, who was the first king of torts? Was it Bel Melvin Belli in San Francisco? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, Melvin Belli in San Francisco. He, he, he uh, adopted he adopted the legend as the king of torts. And um, I started a novel 20 years ago called The King of Torts, and it was, the basis was a Bhopal-type uh, Union Carbide chemical leak that killed a bunch of people in a foreign country, and all the American trial lawyers trying to get there. And I thought it was just brilliant. I thought it was hilarious. And uh, my wife read 100 pages and said, I can't stand these people, OK? And I said, well, okay, I'll show you. So I sent it to my agent in, New York, in Manhattan, and he said, I don't like these people either. So I didn't have a, sh a chance. That book never got written. But I still had the title to, to use. And I have a friend. I have a really close friend who I served in the legislature with who got into mass torts 20 years ago and uh, has told me so many stories about some of the things that happened and some of the, the en enormous amounts of money that trickles down through these settlements. And I was just captivated by it. That's what I do. I mean, I, you know, right now I'm, I'm thinking about the opioid crisis. There's, there's a novel in there somewhere. There's a big, thick novel told from the point of a, maybe a small town lawyer, maybe from a mother who's lost a child, or you know, maybe from, there's so many bad guys. It's just, it's incredible, you know, this, and it's still unfolding. There's so much litigation. Almost every state is, is tied up now in litigation. And I keep, but I keep waiting for that, you know, that story. I'll, I'll, I'll find it one of these days, probably when it's too late. But that's, that's what I do. I, you know, Mass Torch captured my attention for a while, and I wrote a book about it. Yes, sir. <laughs> where, did, where did playing for pizza come from? I was, in, I was in Bologna writing a book called The Broker. 
came out a couple years before. It came out in about 2006, I think. And uh, the broker involves a, a government witness who's in hiding, okay? And I could have put that guy anywhere in the world. And that's one of the fun things about writing. We, you have to go do the research. I love Italy. And I, I've been to most of the big towns in Italy. I'd never been to Bologna. So I threw a map with a, a dart at the map and it hit Bologna. I said, okay, I'm going to put the book there. And so I went off to Bologna to learn the area. And what I typically do, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get the hotel to hire me a car and a driver to show me around. And I hope that the guy speaks pretty good English. And so in, in, in Bologna, working on the, the broker, my driver was this big, husky Italian guy, uh, Luca. And we get in the car, and right off the bat, I want to know how good the English is, because my Italian is not, is not very good. And I said, Luca, you, uh, you know, your English is good. Where do you learn English? Or how would you learn English? He said, I, he said, I play center. I said, well, what are you talking about? I, I don't know soccer. Is there a center? On, you know, he, he's too big for soccer. He said, no, I play center on the football team. And I, one thing led to the other. And uh, he played for the Bologna Warriors in the Italian Football League. And he took me to a practice that afternoon. And it's these big, tough Italian guys who just love to, you know, hit each other. And each, back then, the rules, the rules change every year. Each team could have, like, two Americans. The quarterback is always an American, so the center's got to be able to communicate with the quarterback. And usually they have one little small running back that nobody can catch. Uh, and that's the Italian Football League. And so I was inspired to write this story about a washed up NFL player who lands in Parma, Italy. And we just sold the movie rights, by the way. So we hopefully, I hope they film it over there and then I'll go over and consult before I... <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, advice to an aspiring novelist who can't find the time. Um, well, you have to find the time on a daily basis. Until you start writing at least one page a day, nothing is going to happen. I learned that the hard way. When I, when I started writing A Time to Kill, um, I don't know where I found the energy or the discipline, because I can't do it. I don't have to do it now, but I, I couldn't. I would set my alarm clock for 5 o'clock. I would be at my, my office a few blocks away at 5.30 with a cup of coffee and write the first word at 5.30. I made myself do that five days a week for almost three years. And, and I recall many times being in court at 9 o'clock, exhausted. But again, I was in the legislature, I was practicing law, my wife was having babies, you know, life is pretty crazy. Uh, but I, you have to find a time, whether it's on your lunch break or at midnight or whenever, you've got to find a spot, maybe the same spot. Scott Chereau wrote uh, Presumed Innocent on the train every morning uh, going to downtown Chicago from the suburbs. He got his seat, he got his spot, he started writing every morning. It took him several years. Uh, so. The time is there if you can find it. Sometimes, sometimes one page a day is going to take you 15 minutes. Sometimes it'll take you an hour. But you've got to, you've got to keep pushing every day. A page a day, you know, is not that much. After a year, you've got a lot of pages. Uh, after two years, you've got a full-length novel. And in my case, after three years, I had 1,000 pages. Because I, I didn't know what I was doing. I put everything into the book and they cut a third of it. That was a year of my life. <laughs> I said, I'm too lazy to do this, okay, to waste time. And I learned the beauty and necessity of an outline. I literally said, okay, chapter one, here's a paragraph, what's gonna happen? And then chapter two, not much, just you know, one, two, three, four. When you get to 40, it's the end of the book. And you better know chapter 40 before you start chapter one. Because if you do, you're not going to waste time. You're not going to waste hours and pages and energy writing stuff that's not going to make the cut. You always know where you're going. And that's the, that's the way I've worked now for almost 30 years. 
I just, I, I don't write, that's one of my rules. Don't write the first scene until you know the last one. John Irving says he writes the last sentence before he writes the first sentence. I'm not that smart, but I, I, know, I know my final scene. Yes, sir. I, I, I beg your pardon? Books, um, do we make money off movies? Um, we used to. We used to. When, when um, the firm, Pelican Brief, Client, Rainmaker, Runaway Jury, when those books, the early 1990s, when I finished the manuscript, my agent would take the manuscript before, before, I'm sorry, before editing, he would take it to Hollywood and have an auction. Get all the studios together in the room and would sell the film rights. And one year I would set the record and the next year Michael Crichton would. Then I would, then Crichton. I never met, we never met, but we had the best racket going in town. <laughs> one year Crichton said, I don't care what, what I get, I want one dollar more than Grisham. And, and, it, and it was working. And they, would, and they would pay the money and when they pay a lot of money up front, they have to make the movie. And they would go out and hire these wonderful casts, get a good screenplay, and film the movie within two years, for the first few anyway. And, and they, we had big casts, we had big um, box office grosses, domestic and foreign, they're on TV somewhere tonight. They were popular films. Everybody made money, and for some reason, that model doesn't work now in Hollywood. You can't get a movie made. I can't. Because Hollywood makes so few smart adult dramas. Think, think of almost every week we say, let's go to the movies. Let's get out of the house and go to the movies. You look at the 25 films that we have available in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is you know, most of the big ones, and there's, there's nothing you want to see. The, the, the favorite studio model today is to spend 200, 300 million bucks on Spider-Man 5 and hope it grosses a billion in China and then a billion everywhere else. Well, that's a good model if it works, but that's the way they think. And so it's very, it's very difficult now. Well, I haven't had a movie made in 15 years, and they're all for sale, the ones that have not been adopted, adapted. <laughs> uh, Playing for pizza, uh, it's a combination of some, you have to piece together independent financing and somebody with deep pockets, and, and then in, in that case, somebody who just loves that story and wants to, wants to film it and pay for it. So it's about, about a $15 million budget. So anyway, it's, it's, it's frustrating dealing with Hollywood now. It was fun back then. Um, and, but I also learned there's nothing I can do. I can't, the, you take the Rooster Bar, okay? It was published a year ago. There's nothing I can do today to get that movie made. If I gave away the film rights, if I wrote the screenplay for free, if I said, take it, you have my blessing, that's not gonna move the ball down the field one yard. So if you can't control it, don't worry about it. I just worry about the next book. Yes, ma'am. Uh, her background, she was doing insurance defense with a big firm and quit that and became a public defender and much happier now at <laughs> the big firm. And, yeah, and our, our, our heroine in Gray Mountain is uh, working for a big law firm in, in New York when the recession hits in 2008 and she loses her job. And um, this, that's very true. It happened to a lot of people. And I'm, I'm very active with the Legal Aid Association in Charlottesville and they were, they were flooded with letters from young associates here in New York and other big cities who were given a deal. The deal is um, you can have your job, we're not gonna pay you. We'll keep you sort of on the payroll. We'll, maybe we'll cover your health benefits, maybe not. 
come back and see us in 18 months. Uh, but if you'll go somewhere and work a year or two in a nonprofit, then we'll, you know, we'll, we promise you we'll call you when the things, do, whatever, all these different deals. And they were getting flooded by big firm associates that, you know, who were desperate for something to do. That was my inspiration for Gray Mountain. That and also uh, the actual environmental destruction in Appalachia from mountaintop removal. And it's, it's even worse now than it was when I wrote the book three or four years ago. There's, the regulation is almost gone now. It's just, uh, it's, it's full scale uh, destruction. And nobody's really looking, nobody cares. But you know, you have an administration that's pushing coal big times and nobody's, nobody's watching the miners. Yes, sir. Are we, are we? Okay, sir. The question is, in runaway jury, the, 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 it's, a, it's a tobacco trial. The first time the big tobacco loses a jury trial. And at, that, at, that, at that time, there had not been a loss. They had won like 85 straight trials with a very effective argument that everybody knows that smoking kills, so why smoke? And we all know someone who quit, so anybody can quit. That's the way big tobacco won many, many trials. Um, they came close to losing one one time in Mississippi by, by one vote. In 1985, it would have been a massive burden. Anyway, that was my background for, I was also fascinated with the, with the um, idea of a person, a very smart person, tracking litigation and getting put on a jury. You know, could it be done? And that's what happened in the book. So we have that thing all teed up to, to film in Biloxi, Mississippi, where it's set. Um, we had um, Sean Connery, Glenneth Paltrow, Ed Norton. The cast was beautiful, and, and the screenplay was good. It was all set to go. And the director, at the last moment, uh, jumped off the bus and everything crashed. And it took 10 years to finally get the movie made. And it was actually uh, it was a very good movie. In the meantime, the legal landscape changed. Once they had the global tobacco settlement, in, in the middle of all that, it changed some of the issues. And so they came back to me and said, okay, we're, we're they, they weren't afraid of big tobacco. They said, you know, the legal, the, the laws changed with tobacco and tobacco litigation. We want to go a different direction. Um, can you help us find some more bad guys? And I said, that's the easiest thing I do, okay, is find bad guys. So we settled on gun manufacturers. Really good movie. It, uh, it didn't do well at the box office uh, initially. It's kind of hung around over the past 15 years, and you know it's it's still still being shown. One more, yes, ma'am. We were talking about it over lunch with the dean uh, when I, when I wrote the book. Came out last year, so I started writing it a couple years ago. The, the uh, for-profit law school scam was blowing up. There were only about six of them then. Um, and I think the one in Charlotte closed, the one in Florida, I, I, I knew what they were then. So I took that and embellished it somewhat as I am able to do because I write fiction and I can say anything I want to say. Um, I, made, I made the, I increased the number of for-profit law schools and uh, which I still think is should be against the law, is to allow people to profit from education. Uh, but they, you know, they charge enormous tuitions and, and let anybody in, and so the students go and, and borrow the money. I, I love to um, set books in D.C. I live a couple of hours away by car, and we go there all the time, and it's a fun city to, you know, to research and to write, to, to find good scenes, good places to put the book. So, uh, no, it's not based on any one law school, it's sort of a, collage of several. We have time. Thank you, Dean. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. John, thank you for honoring us by allowing us to honor you. I think that you have all day long 
given us evidence of the moral conviction that lies behind your novels. And the heroes and heroines are often lovable rogues. Uh, and you described the critique from your wife that you shouldn't get up on a soapbox and, and preach to the audience. And to have done as successfully and as well as what, what you have done, which is to convey that moral conviction to your readers and to convey it to us here today, the, represents really the best of what I think lawyers can aspire to, aspire to and novelists as well. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you.